Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today we have Jenny Gu and Stephen Louie. Jenny and Stephen are both managing partners at Vertical Street Ventures, a real estate syndication company. Previously, Jenny was an executive at Procter & Gamble, managing a multi-billion dollar portfolio in market strategy and planning. Jenny now focuses on asset management within Vertical Street. Stephen was previously an executive at MetLife, I believe it was 16 years, and now has grown his multi-family portfolio to over 2,500 units. He focuses on acquisitions, sourcing capital, and building key strategic relationships for their team. So thank you so much for both coming on. Thanks for having us, Charles. Yeah, thanks, Charles. It's great to have uh, two people on that run different parts of the business, and then we can cover a ton of different ground and uh, answer a lot of questions that listeners might have. But um, as we're starting off, um, Jenny, give us a little background on yourself, both uh, personally and professionally prior to getting involved in real estate investing and Vertical Street. Absolutely. Uh, so Charles, as you mentioned, I am a recovering sales executive. Um, I spent 13 years at Procter & Gamble working with fabulous people. It's a great company. Loved my team. Um, but you know what? While we were there, both my husband and I worked there, we wanted to diversify our portfolio. And so we started looking into real estate. And I'm sure like many of your listeners, we started with single family and then quickly learned that there has got to be a way to scale and grow faster. So we learned about multifamily and I actually did it backwards. I, I believed in this model so much so that I actually left my corporate job, retired, if you will, uh, before even purchasing a single multifamily door. Um, so I burnt the bridges, left, um, and fast forward two and a half years later, we're managing you know, a $200 million portfolio. Um, so that's kind of the, the long and short of it, but I live in Southern California with my husband and two kids, and we are just loving our life by design now. Uh, before I get to Steven, uh, Jenny, would you do that again? What, how you had done that and uh, burning the bridges, burning the ships, as they say, and uh, would you do it if you could do it all over again? I would say, um, I think my timeline would have shortened. So everything that I've done has been successful because of my experience in corporate America. So I wouldn't give that up. But if I had known this 15 years ago, I think, um, you know, my, my track would have been slightly different. Do you think that you would have uh, gotten more involved with purchase properties first and then left your job? Or would you have kept that same where you left and then started investing in a multifamily? Well, I mean, we need capital to invest at yeah. some point or another. So I would certainly still start my career with PNG. I think what I would have done personally was instead of buying that first house that everybody thinks is successful, maybe I would have house hacked and bought a duplex or fourplex instead. There's things that I would I yeah. teach, you know, friends and family now that I would have done earlier on. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So Stephen, what was your background prior to getting involved with uh, Vertical Street and Jenny? Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Charles. No, absolutely. I was a corporate America guy all my life as well. I spent about 25 plus years in corporate America and uh, started really on the finance side, transitioned into a sales role and then into leadership. So really covered all aspects within corporate America. Fortunate enough to start in a cubicle and end in a corner office. And about halfway through my career, I um, started investing in single family homes, very similar to what Jenny and Ronnie have done. And so built a pretty strong portfolio up, but then realized that there has to be something else, just like Jenny had mentioned, and uh, was introduced to multifamily about uh, five years ago. And uh, the great thing about multifamily and commercial real estate is you can force that appreciation and, or I say, create appreciation uh, within those assets. And so that was uh, kind of the eye-opening moment for me. And um as I continued to build that, uh, right when COVID, after COVID hit, um, or right around COVID time, I had met Jenny and her husband at a meetup, and uh, kind of the rest was history in terms of building a business that uh, the platform that we've built. Uh, and uh, really enjoy what I do. I left corporate America, and uh, that's where we started Vertical Street Ventures. And so 
Uh, I think you asked Jenny that same question, what would you have done this earlier? I say absolutely. I spent uh, most of my time as a W-2 wage earner, focused on what I was supposed to do, invest in my 401k, maxing out my 401k, doing all the right things, climbing that corporate ladder. I think I probably would have exited probably halfway through my career. Uh, but I can't thank Corporate America enough. They've given Jenny and I all the skill sets to take this company, Vertical Street Ventures, to that next level. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, so staying with, staying with you uh, for a little bit, Stephen, because uh, you're dealing a lot more, as I understand, with a lot of the acquisitions. And um, give us a little overview of what your current investment criteria and strategy is. And then, the, and also, I see that you guys have some larger properties and you also have some, I would say smaller, but not really. I mean, 28 units or some other stuff. So are you kind of, how is your investment criteria um, set up? Yeah, I think like, like any business, uh, you do have to make some plans and uh, you, you plan out your year on what you want to accomplish. And mm -hmm. I think goal setting is super important. So when you're first getting into the syndication business or any type of investing in business, you do set that criteria. And so I was always a fan of starting a little bit smaller and actually understanding how all of the, the details work. And so my first initial um, apartments that we focused on were just things that we could afford from a joint venture perspective. At least that was my perspective on it. I can look, touch and feel and understand it just like single family homes. But then after realizing some of that, you do scale and you change some of your criteria. So I'd say my criteria originally was, hey, that 20 unit, that 25 unit, those were really perfect in terms of trying to drive overall NOI, growth, understanding how property management works, understanding how a whole entire syndication works. And then now, if we fast forward where we are today, Jenny, or the Vertical Street Venture team, Jenny and myself, it's really focusing on 100 units and above. So our criteria, 100 units above, we're really laser focused in the Arizona marketplace, class B, class B minus, C plus property, where there is the opportunity to drive value, maybe taking it over for somebody that owned that property for 20 plus years. And there, there are those opportunities out there. And as you build more relationships, whatever market you're in, that can take you to that next level. And then you build those relationships with brokers and key stakeholders that actually help you drive that, that drive, drive some of the results based on the criteria I just mentioned. Yeah, awesome. one yeah. thing I'll add to that too, Charles, if you don't mind. Um, strategically, we have an academy as well where we teach other syndicators how to do what we do. Because like I mentioned earlier, I wish somebody taught me this 15, 20 years ago. Um, but part of the, the, the smaller portfolio strategy is we also partner with some of our students on their first deals. And so a lot of those that you see in, in listed there are deals that we're partnering with our students on to help them get their foot in the door as well. So that's why you see such a wide range of sizes. No, that's fine. I own a bunch of different sizes. I own smaller properties myself and I own larger ones in joint ventures and the larger ones in syndications. I just, it's just something that I picked up as I was doing my research and um, I kind of see that where uh, I like seeing that a lot, actually, because I like seeing um, you have people that are looking for returns and looking for deals. And everybody, I feel, you know, 75 plus, 100 plus units, but I also also always put a caveat in there myself, is if it really makes sense and it's close to that, we're going to, our group's going to bend the rules a little bit because we're looking for returns, especially in where we are right now in this crazy market. So it's one of those things that um, I just, that's one thing I just wanted to kind of dig into when I saw, because it's not something, you know, most people are just kind of like dead set syndicators, only this and above and, or we, we pass on it. Um, one thing with you, Jenny, I want to say, because both of you had started off in smaller properties and you're dealing a lot more with the asset management. So was I found it with larger properties that were operating, that were buying with investors, it's much easier to manage our manager's contract or everything else that goes with it. Are you finding that um, that it's it's easier to manage asset management properties that are larger than ones that are smaller? I would say each one has its pros and cons. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's easier. I would actually say it takes the same amount of time. So right. what I mean by that is, you know, we have weekly calls with our property management team. I am on the same one hour call on a 28 unit as I am on a same one hour call with 252 unit property. So I'm spending a disproportionate amount of time per unit. 
if you look at it that way. So it just takes more time. The challenges are the same. You look at occupancy, vacancy, you know, uh, expenses. It, it all is the same type of work. Now, what I'll tell you also is on larger properties, you just, you certainly have less risk, right? So if you have a 30 unit property, your vacancy risk is a lot higher than you do on a 200 unit property. So it just depends on how you're looking at it. But from a amount of work standpoint, that's why I always tell people where you can scale up faster because it literally is the same amount of work, um, whether it's five or 150 units. Yeah, and that might have, I must have uh, reformed that question as being a time intensive per unit mm -hmm. because it's much scalable with larger units, more units under uh, one umbrella. Uh, so Jenny, let's stay with you one second. What are the, if people are interested in seeing exactly, because we have two people on that have uh, different roles that work together in purchasing properties with investors. Are you able to describe the different roles on a multifamily and or commercial real estate syndication team? Yeah, so you could break it down really into three major components. Um, you need somebody to lead acquisitions. So that person is the relationship builder. They're working with brokers. They're underwriting the deals, making sure that we can actually it's the right property to purchase. Um, you also have a capital raiser or investor relations lead. So this person is the main single point of contact for finding capital for the project and handholding the investor through the entire process. And then last but not least, and the least talked about, I would say in this industry is the asset manager. So once you close on a property, that's when the you know rubber hits the road. And for the next five or so years, all that work is on the asset manager to make sure the business plan is being executed. Those are the three, I would say, fundamental roles. And then everything around is support and peripheral. Nice. Okay. Um, when you're talking asset management, you're usually, you're going to be focusing a lot more with working with property manager and then working mm -hmm. uh, with any kind of contractors you have or any type of value add uh, scenario and uh, kind of play you're putting together there. The um, With your property managers, because you're buying a lot of properties in, um, I think I saw like four different states, something like this. How are you finding your property management companies and or vetting them, something like this, which, because I feel the property management is probably one of the most important strategic partners mm -hmm that us, uh, any type of investor has, whether it's a syndication firm or just a mom and pop? Absolutely. They are probably, um, you know, outside of the, the asset manager themselves, like what I do, the property manager is essentially your make or break on the, on the <laughs> property. So it's super, super critical to find the right ones. I would treat them as if they're part of your team, because they are, and go through the whole entire interview process. So meet with their entire team, um, look at their reports, walk properties that they currently manage that's not currently your own. So is the property clean? Does it look well run? Is it low deferred maintenance? Um, I would also ask for referrals, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. can you give me the name of, you know, two or three current owners? Obviously, if they don't, that's a red flag, but call them and say, hey, how has your experience been with, you know, XYZ property management? You'll get the really release that way. Um, but, you know, we always say in any industry, hire slow, fire fast. So if they are not performing, you want to quickly give them a, you know, 30 or 60 day kind of probation period before you move on, because that's not something that you can afford with investors. Yeah, that's great information. The uh, thing I found is asking for referrals from other property owners in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, you'll see on their websites, the property managers, they'll put properties up there and just a drive by of seeing just small things. There's a little yeah. trash here. There's this, this isn't this hallways, you know, whatever it might be. And um, it can kind of give you a background into where you're going, whether than the problem is I always ask for referrals and I always feel I'm being put to these perfect uh, partners that they have investors that they have that love them. And that's, who you're getting a referral from. So it's kind of, you know, you, you got to do your own due diligence too. So that's great information. Mm -hmm. um, Steven, I want to know, because you do work a lot with strategic partnerships. So when you're, when someone's looking to scale into larger properties, um, you know, how important are partnerships? Um, I mean, I imagine they're crucial when you're going into larger properties is what I found. Do you have advice for investors looking to make the leap into partnering and how to find partners that will both grow their business and their partner's business? No, that's, a, that's a great question, Charles. I think one of the key things that I always, um, that I've built my kind of entire career on is relationships. And so you know, with the partners that you partner with, you have to really have a, a strong relationship with. And it's beyond, because uh, really that relationship is for at least five, maybe six, maybe 10 years potentially. And um, 
you don't want to try to just kick the tires with anybody. So um, I'm a fan of understanding who the, who we're working with. You have to do background checks on it and be honest with them. I'll actually ask them, have you ever had a felony before? And if they, you know, or have you, how many tickets have you had? So you have to understand the character of the individuals that you're partnering with. And, you know, with all social media and podcast, everything that we're doing right now, we only see all the positives of everything yes. that goes on. And really, you know, my first couple partnerships that I actually had, you know, where I started as a key principal, just signing on loans and not really even getting compensated for it, just so I understood the business. Um, some of those partnerships just didn't turn out as well because I didn't understand really what they were doing on the property. They gave me, I had no insight. It did give me the ability to sign on loans on my own in the future. So I thank folks for that. But at the end of the day, choose your partners wisely and um, find out a little bit more about them outside of what you see on social media. Yeah, that's great. The other thing too is uh, I think kind of testing a deal with them. So maybe not going full in with a complete partnership right away and maybe doing a deal where they have a different LLC. You have a different LLC and just set up one for a deal specific and see how it works and um, you know, see if what your expectations uh, have been met on both sides. And that's why sometimes we do say when you start with this. So everybody's like, hey, go with start. I see people pushing, hey, start with 100 units and above, nothing else. <laughs> but sometimes it's okay to go with a 20 unit. Yeah. And that's your first opportunity. And that's your first partnership. The risk is a little bit less. Yes, the vacancy and all the things that Jenny just talked about are a little bit more challenging. But it is easier if you do have to break that apart. And you could probably un unwind that a little simpler than maybe a 280 unit or a 200 unit versus a 20 unit. So right. that makes some sense. Yeah, especially especially if it's a joint venture and there's no passive investors with it, because mm -hmm. then you have a whole different part of the business that now needs to be uh, brought into the fold of what's happening and why this is going this way. Um, but even, Steve go even going into the relationships, things do change over time as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say make sure that your operating agreements, all of the legal ease are actually checked off. A lot of times we, we so quickly want to scale because we see everybody else doing it, uh, but we forget to kind of check off, oh, who's getting compensated on what? And then things change even if we had a discussion on this. Oh yeah, didn't we talk about specifically this? But if it's not documented somewhere, um, maybe that the discussion didn't happen. Or if it had to stand up in a court of law, where would that stand? And so building those uh, processes all up front, which we're pretty good at from a team perspective of doing when we build those partnerships is really crucial to the success of a syndicator or an investor out there. Uh, some great information. It's funny because the first pro uh, multifamily property I bought in 06, um, we were sitting at the closing table and one of the investors was telling me, uh, he was saying that um, his old, his this is a new partnership for him. His first partnership never worked out because they were, he was in his twenties and the guy that was funding everything was like in his fifties or sixties, which obviously there's going to be a difference of how you want to invest and what your goal is. One just wants to make some, I wouldn't say quick cash, but not long-term and someone else wants to build like a whole thing. So it's not just that you just, it's different alignment of interest, I guess you would say too. And like you said, Stephen, it changes. So it's very important to kind of find out what people's five, 10, 15 year plan is uh, when getting into business with them. Because usually these transactions are going to last uh, five, seven years. It's been shorter these days, but at some point when uh, everything goes a little sideways, it's going to be longer again. So um, Stephen, tell me, just staying with you, what are the common mistakes you see real estate investors make? Uh, so from a, a limited, there's a couple of things. There's also the limited partner side and the general partner side. So limited partner side, I think uh, I see a lot of individuals, just the fear of missing out. They want to get in an opportunity. And so they are so quick to just jump right on the opportunities. I did that myself. I mean, my, when I first started into this multifamily uh, business, I started as an LP and I just said, oh, I got to get in as many as possible. And, you know, the market has been awesome for probably most of the investors that are listening to the podcast at this point, but there are points in times, some just don't work out or some you, you'd have no cash flow when you were expecting 8% cash flow. So I'd say as a limited partner, really vet out that uh, general partner, ask them the hard, the difficult questions, ask them about um, how their returns are, ask them for some performer information. Don't be afraid to uh, challenge them on some of the questions that are super important in terms of running a business and how many syndications have they done? My initial ones were with people that were all brand new. Fortunately, they all worked out. They all, for the most part, worked out. But I would probably not invest with somebody that, that didn't have a lot of experience or who wasn't partnered with somebody who had some experience. Because 
it's kind of the, the chicken or the egg. You do need, like when you graduate college and you're trying to get your first job, but you have no experience and you're getting beaten out by all those people that have experience, but sometimes you have to find and build that relationship with that individual. And so really understand that, that, that particular person. And on the general partner side, uh, like we just mentioned, just choose your partner wisely. Do the due diligence on it. it. You know, I know things are moving so quickly. Hey, we need the paperwork signed by tomorrow. If it really does, then take the time and say, hey, one more day probably will not hurt us. And if they don't want to partner with you, maybe you take a step, a side step and look for someone else. But the key thing is you do have to execute eventually. So you can sit on the sidelines and um, analysis paralysis, I call it, and never <laughs> kind of lean in. That, that won't get you anywhere, but do your, the best due diligence you can. And then once, once you've done that, lean in and this business uh, and ecosystem is, is a wonderful place to be. Awesome. Uh, Jenny, what would you say to that? I mean, what kind of mistakes do you see at real estate investors make? And you're on a different side of the business. So you're probably cleaning up a lot of mistakes when you're taking over properties or changing management and, uh, you know, on that side of it. Yeah, yeah, so I can hit it on both sides as well. So an LP, similar to what Steve mentioned, but on the flip side also, you know, I meet a lot of investors who I've talked to two, three, four times, and they've still yet to do their first investment. So um, again, whole agree with the analysis paralysis. Yesterday was the best time to invest. <laughs> you know, today is the next best time. So don't delay um, because we all know how the stock market is performing right these days. Um, from a GP perspective, I would say common mistakes investors are making right now they're not, again, COVID just hit everybody by surprise. So there's a lot of things we couldn't control or didn't predict. Now that we're in it a couple of years, we have to make sure if you're looking at underwriting to expect certain expenses to go up dramatically. Things like insurance, taxes, materials, labor, payroll is going up. So as investors start to look at deals and underwrite, we have to make sure they're you know, raising expenses to certain degrees to account for all of these unexpected um, increases. Yeah. I think that's very good information. I think insurance is something that people are not, they're not writing that at increasing at what it should be. And I, you know, if I've seen inc uh, this insurance rates going, these to be, you know, three, 4%, now it's five and seven. I have other partners telling me it's, you know, so depending on where you are in the country, but the cost of materials and replacement costs has just, uh, you know, the cost to replace uh, properties is just very expensive now compared to what it was just a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, just following up with you, Jenny, one last question. What do you think are the main factors that have contributed to your success? Um, it could be personally and or professionally. Gosh, I would say if I look at the people who I admire too, and who I believe are successful in this industry, and unfortunately, both Steve and I have this skill set is just sales and relationship building. So we've learned a lot of things in our corporate experience to be able to influence people, um, our investors, our partners um, to sell. And this is a people first industry. So you're always building relationships. People have to like you, they have to trust you. Um, so I think the people who are most successful have been able to sharpen that, sharpen that skill set and really excel in that area. Oh, that's, that's great. That's fantastic. Relationships are very important in this business. Uh, Stephen, what would you say to that as uh, main factors that have uh, contributed to your success over the years, uh, personally or professionally? Yeah, I think one thing that I've always had through my corporate career and also through real estate is a, a strong mentor and somebody that is mentoring me across the board. So I was fortunate enough in corporate America where they... Um, I was a, considered a high performer. And so what they do with high performers, they give them mentors. And those mentors meet with you every week or every, every quarter. And they go, they review things. They, they ask you to re read a book and uh, basically do a book report review on that particular book. And um, they give you some of the guidance to help you climb that corporate ladder. Same thing with real estate. Um, if you asked me five years ago, I was only in single family homes. I went I seeked out a mentor, hired a mentor. That mentor helped, helped me give me all of the basic operation and skill set to do what uh, we are doing today, Jenny and myself and all of Vertical Street Ventures. And so that's a, a crucial piece of growing is having somebody that knows more about you. I think one of the things too, I, I always say, um, Tony Robbins has a quote out there and it says, success leaves clues. And so 
why should we go out and try to recreate the wheel? We probably don't need to do that. Somebody else has done that. Why not go and partner with that individual? And that's how this great ecosystem, we all kind of work together. It's one of the unique ones where, um, you know, some of my friends say, why would you want to be helping and teaching other people how to do this? Aren't they going to be your competitors? And I said, well, there's, there's so many apartment complexes out there that I can't own all of them. And so why not uh, teach others uh, similar to the processes that we put in place to build our company? We can do the same uh, for others as well. Awesome, Stephen. That's great. Uh, so Jenny, how can our listeners learn more about you and uh, Vertical Street Ventures? Absolutely. You can visit us at verticalstreetventures.com and our contact information is on there if you'd like to connect. Uh, We're also hosting our first ever uh, national investor conference this June 4th and 5th in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, tickets are selling fast. We are going to be teaching everything nuts to bolts. Again, we wish somebody taught us this sooner. And day two, we have a bus tour where we'll take you around our properties so you can see the business plan come to life. So you can visit vsvcon.com for tickets and more information there as well. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Looking forward to uh, connecting with you in the near future and have a great rest of your week. Thanks for having us, Charles. Charles. Talk to you soon. Hi guys, it's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at schedulecharles.com. That's schedulecharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.